Now, say my name. Eisenberg. You're goddamn right. <laughs> Oh, man. You guys have been asking for this one. I'm glad I waited. You'll understand why. Coming up here, everybody jump the gun. You all jump the gun. It's all all on you, man. See one good quick hit story. Looks like red meat. Got to back up off of that. Got to wait for it to develop. It's a rookie move. Today, we're going to talk about Bill and Melinda Gates' divorce, why he's a big, big, big fish. Hey. Like that new intro? I tweaked things a little bit. I hope, uh, I hope the audio worked out pretty well. I never know what's going to happen with StreamYard. Unless I still left the applause in. That's enough of that. Okay. So uh, today is a pre-record. I uh, apologize in advance simply because uh, I have to take my dogs. My good best friend, Ned, has to go get his teeth ultrasonically cleaned. And there's only one place, apparently, in northern Nevada that I can do this. So um, I have to go do it at 245 today. So I'm doing a pre-record today. Uh, I am going to make this an instant premiere so you guys can sort of follow along uh, in the chat. Uh, if you want to give me super chats, that's fine. Um, but I would suggest this, at least for this particular episode. Um, if you want to support the show in some way, uh, f- uh, please look into maybe uh, just doing like a PayPal uh, donation or a or uh, I don't know, some kind of hit, quick hit. Uh, I, I take crypto too. All, all of the um, all of the ways you can uh, donate to the show and you can support the show is uh, in the description in every single one. So have a look at that. And um, and that helps me out. And that helps us out. And it helps Ned out too, because his teeth are very expensive and so are Bambi. So they're both coming in the back of the truck and we're probably going to drive about 45 minutes to get to this place. So that's the that's my story and i'm sticking with it um so bill and melinda gates when i saw this when i saw the story of course where everybody knows that uh, uh good old hair let me put it back up uh bill and melinda there you have them wasn't that a great picture uh bill and melinda gates have decided that they are going to go their separate ways uh melinda gates i believe is 57 maybe 58. And I know that um, Bill Gates is something like 64, 65. I'm not really sure. Um, You know, a little bit of an age difference right there, but you know, okay, that is what it is. Uh, I'm going to read a few little tidbits that I've been picking up, at least from, uh, what is it, People Magazine here. And I hate I, I hate to be the one to be paparazzi, yes. I hate to be the one who's like reading, you know, into stuff like uh, Prince Harry and, and uh, Meghan Markle and all that good stuff. But every once in a while, a story drops in my lap. Uh, as you know, uh, the story with uh, Will Smith is actually taking a bit of a development recently as well. Um, Will Smith is not looking too good. People say it's it's for a movie role. Okay, but uh, we'll see how things go. Um, he's kind of he's way over much. He doesn't look like Will Smith anymore. He really doesn't. Um, <laughs> so, or at least not the the Will Smith that we all knew in like the the eighties and the nineties. So. So what's going on with Bill? What's going on with this? Is this gray divorce? Is this the, uh, oh, well, we're, we're empty nesters and we're finally coming to uh, the conclusion that uh, we're looking across the breakfast table at one another and you're old and I'm old and now the kids are out of the house and we're empty nesters. And so, you know what? I can't really think about, I, I, I really can't live with this guy anymore. So therefore I'm going to uh, back up and out of this. Uh, I'm out. Thanks. See you later. Uh, if you don't know what gray divorce is, I'll, uh, I will explain it to you. Actually, I have a, 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 at least one essay that I know of about gray divorce. Um, and I wrote that as a result of another article that I had read um, from an actual psychologist, from a, a marriage counselor. And she had written this because she had such a high incidence of um, older women divorcing perfectly good guys, as far as she was concerned. And she was really, you know, kind of put out by this. And there is a tendency 
for uh, older couples um, when they get to becoming empty nesters or they get to a certain point in their maturity, I guess, as a, as a, as a couple and as a married couple. And they just simply have been together for a long time and they've been together uh, as a role or they've been sticking it out, I should say, because they're doing it for the kids, right? They're doing it because it's the right thing to do. And um, I'm not sure that this is exactly what's going on with Bill and Melinda Gates here. Uh, I also would argue that it is not what went on with uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, Mackenzie Bezos, and as well as uh, Lauren Sanchez. But there's a there's a lesson to be learned there as well. Um, I I have to. I'm going I'm to start out with a couple things here. I'm going to have to preface a few things once again, as I often do. Um, when we look at high profile, very rich men. Uh, I mean, he's at least the second richest man in the world, or maybe he's the third. I'm not really 100% sure where he ranks, but uh, let's just say we know Jeff Bezos is the richest man in the world. So I've had, the, I've had this conversation before, I think it was with Rich. I think I might have even talked about this with um, with Pat Campbell back when um, Jeff Bezos and, and Mackenzie Bezos decided to part ways. And a lot of the same things that uh, transpired when uh, Jeff and Mackenzie decided to split are also um, occurring right now. And the, the backstory to this, I think, is more entertaining almost than the, um, than actual, or I should say, the, 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 the post-action report, right? Like what happens in the wake of all this is almost more interesting than what led to that particular split up. And... I know what's going to happen and it's already been happening. I've already seen this on several other channels when I was doing the homework for today's today's video. The mistake here is to um, pile on with the obvious answer. And the obvious answer is this. It's the black pill, MGTOW, uh, doom pill, whatever. If, if, uh, if Jeff Bezos can't make it work, what chance do I have? If Bill and Melinda Gates can't make it work, then what chance do I have? Here we have proof of concept once again that marriages don't work. Well, nobody's saying that they're perfect and no one's saying that they they ought to be working. And yes, you're 100% right. That's that's the state of modern marriage today. Congratulations. One golden check mark for you. However, as, as tempting as it is to sort of like run that up the flagpole and see who salutes, you have to understand what happened to get to that point. Why was it a good idea for Bill Gates to get married in the first place? Why does a guy like that get married? Why does a guy like that get married with no prenuptial agreement? Because he's an idiot? I don't think so. I don't think Bill Gates is an idiot. I don't. I don't know the guy personally. I don't think Elon Musk is an idiot. And Elon, if you're watching, I have your signed copy of the Rational Mail right here. When we look at guys who are high profile um, thinkers, I guess, innovators, entrepreneurs, um, the best I can um, compare this to, the, the archetype would be uh, Steve Jobs from Apple. Steve Jobs was very much, um, I want to say, an autistic personality. He's, he was a, a um, if you've ever read the uh, autobiography of Steve Jobs, uh, the people who worked with him from the very earliest years, even uh, Steve Wozniak, his partner, uh, they described Steve Jobs as sort of this egomaniacal kind of guy. But the most common thing that they said about him is what, that he had this reality distortion bubble that kind of went on around him. And when you get to, and I would argue also that Steve Jobs was a pathological personality, right? He lived in his own world and he had his own ideas about what he wanted to have in those particular worlds. And he wasn't the most social guy. He didn't understand, uh, certainly didn't understand intersexual dynamics. Uh, he was more, he was very much an ideas guy. And this is what I was able to glean, let's just say from uh, reading his uh, biography. And, um, and I picked up a lot of that as so I'm not, again, I don't know him firsthand. I didn't, I didn't grow up with Steve Jobs, nor did I grow up with Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos for that matter. So I, all of this is third party and you're free to disagree with me if you'd like. However, I would argue that a guy like Steve Jobs was most definitely on the spectrum. I would also argue that Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, the richest men in the world, the innovators of the world, the idea guys of the world, or the guys who are, even if they're not innovators, they're fast followers enough 
to have positioned themselves in such a way that they became the richest men in the world. And as a result of that, it takes almost like a single-minded reality distortion bubble around you and a pathological personality to affect that. Now, in the past, I've talked about other pathological personalities, and I'm not going to name names, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're an egotist, just because you have ego, just because you are in some way uh, autistic, I think it was Elon Musk was saying recently, I don't know if this, somebody can tell me if this is true, but on uh, Saturday Night Live, he was saying that he had, uh, he was the first uh, host with Asperger's syndrome or who have, was on the spectrum at the very least. And then of course, Dan Aykroyd has to pipe up and say, no, I have Asperger's syndrome. I was the first. And, and you would expect people with Asperger's syndrome to go, no, nah, I'm the first. No, I'm the first. I'm, like it's like, it's like it's a win, right? That's not the win you think it is, but it's a win in the sense that it's a recognition. And it's like, look, I did good. Look, I made good. And when I see guys like um, uh, Bill Gates, and you know doing what bill gates does now say what you want to and i'm sure i'm going to see it in the comments here that he's the devil that he is the agent of the antichrist or he is um in some way the the vaccine the vaccine guy who's trying again trying to position himself to be at, at the very least profit from it and god knows what else uh he's trying to do with this uh, of course, the rumors are flying around that maybe uh, Melinda is, is an anti-vaxxer or whatever. And she didn't want to have anything to do with her. She couldn't put up with him anymore. Um, Bill Gates has spent time with Jeffrey Epstein. We know that. He's been on the island. People are, are throwing that one out. Um, there's rumors flying around, of course, that um, Bill Gates had a, an ex-girlfriend that he was allowed to spend. Allowed? Allowed to spend. <laughs> he's the richest man in the world. He was allowed to spend... Um, one weekend a year, I think, or one week a year with his ex-girlfriend on some like private island or some like private resort of some kind on the beach. I think it was in North Carolina or something like that. I've got the I've got the details here. If you really want them, you can go look them up. Today's show is not about the salaciousness. I'm not trying to be National Enquirer here. I'm just trying to I'm I just work here, man. I'm just presenting you the facts. Uh, I'll, I'll show. Actually, you know what? Why don't we do this right now? I'm going to. um. I'm going to bring up the picture of our, our the ex-girlfriend. Let's look at the ex-girlfriend here really quickly. This is uh, this is the chick that uh, Je or, excuse me that uh, Bill Bill Gates uh, is spending uh, one weekend a year, I believe, by permission. It's his hall pass. <laughs> uh, I don't know who this person is per se. I'm sure I, you can go find it if you want to go look it up uh, in People Magazine. There's a, a lot of uh, a lot of details that are coming out right now. And again, one of the reasons why I held off from uh, from hitting on this is because when something like this comes around, especially the stuff with uh, Jeff Bezos was a, a, a prime example of this. It pays to be patient. And it pays to figure out, you know, it, it pays to, to wait just a little bit because like when when Bill Gates, or excuse me, when uh, uh, Jeff Bezos' uh, divorce was happening, then we heard about Lauren Sanchez and how she was kind of she's was really a predatory kind of female, at least by the, by the textbook definition. Uh, Lauren slash Dirty Sanchez was uh, a de most definitely a predatory female, and what I, I'll, I'll explain that here in just a second. But like as far as the stories coming out and everything, um, you know, her brother had released or had leaked some information about. Uh, Jeff and and Lauren being together, and of course that set every that that you know that was the catalyst, right? It, everything sort of snowballed after that. So sometimes it, play, it pays off to to wait a little bit. In fact, I'm probably going to regret doing this on my Sunday show because I will guarantee you that something right around like Wednesday or something will, you know, will come to light. And oh boy, I wish I would have known that before I jumped the gun. But everybody else is jumping the gun right now. So we've got, uh, and then let's have a look again at Melinda here. Yeah, remember, this is she's a bit older here, so she's she's fifty seven. I, I was looking at some other pictures of them, um, you know, when they when they first got married. Now, they've been married for like about 25, 27 years. They got married in the mid nineties, I believe. So, and they have children. The youngest of which is like eighteen right now. So there is that aspect, and that's a, what a lot of people are following up on, especially in the People magazine and. The, you're probably going to hear this on Oprah or Dr. Phil. So everybody's going to, everybody and their mother's going to jump on this right now. 
What they won't be jumping on is the fact that Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, uh, even um, Steve Jobs are what I've uh, talked about in the past as a big fish. And it doesn't, you don't have to be the richest man in the world to be a big fish. Okay. You just have to be rich enough to change that woman's life, to change a predatory, a predatory females uh, understand and can read a big fish from a very far distance. I mean, they, they understand it's, it's very obvious to them. I'll, I've got a few little anecdotal stories to tell you what, like to sort of describe what a big fish is, but a big fish is something that uh, is, is a guy that a woman will play the long game for Mackenzie Bezos was not much of a catch. Let's be honest, but Jeff Bezos back prior to uh, launching uh, Amazon or when he was in the midst of launching Amazon um, was not a catch himself. I mean, let's be honest. He means he was a nerd, right? He, his, the odds of Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, uh, even maybe to a lesser degree, Steve Jobs, um, and certainly Elon Musk, uh, reproducing or, or hooking up or, or living the life of Dan Bilzerian, right? Is pretty slim if that guy doesn't luck out in some way and doesn't see how to uh, capitalize on that. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg, very, very much a an, uh, a pathological uh, and a dangerously pathological personality. Um, same thing. I would I would argue that uh, I would argue that some of the most sort of, I, for lack of a better term, I, I know I'm I, this isn't the clinical term, but for lack of a better term, the Asperger syndrome guys, the autistic guys, if they're in the right place at the right time and they can leverage or they can see sort of the signs or they can sort of read the zeitgeist of that particular era. They, those are the guys that become Steve jobs. They become Mark Zuckerberg. They become uh, a guy like Bill Gates, right? Bill Gates is a big fish. All those guys I just mentioned are big fish, but there are other guys who have, maybe they have their own business. Maybe they're, they're set. Maybe they look like they have potential to be a big fish and women take that chance. They pile on. And there's two, I, I think there's kind of two, um, two types of women. And I hate to categorize here, but I think there's two types of women that, uh, sort of focus on the big fish. There's, there's women who get a big fish and they didn't realize they, they had thought the guy had potential. They didn't know that, that the guy was going to be a, you know, a, a, a Jeff Bezos, but maybe he was going to be a surgeon. Maybe he was going to be a business owner of some kind. Maybe he was going to be a you know a star player on the law law firm or something like that. Uh, the guy had potential, and I've talked about the uh, the curse of potential um, in several essays before. But uh, part of potential is real. You know, part of a man's potential is actually realizing his potential. And the way that hypergamy works for women is that and I've described this in the past is that women have a very short window of time in their lifespans. So between the ages of uh, I've described it as 18 to about 28 years old is the primary window of opportunity that women have to use their youth, their beauty, their fertility, younger, hotter, tighter to consolidate on hypergamy. Now, Rich Cooper has mentioned in the past that, um, you know, women don't care about your struggles. They only wait at the, uh, the finish line and they bang the winners. Well, that is true. The problem is, is that most women can't identify a winner. They don't know and they can't afford to wait around in order to identify that winner. And that's really how hypergamy works amongst the sisterhood. Because as I mentioned in, I think it was like a couple episodes back, uh, the sisterhood Uberalis. The sisterhood Uberalis exists for support and nurturement, of course, but it also exists to help women define and understand who has potential, what guy has potential. It's easy to see, like we, we talk about this all the time. It's on Fresh and Fit, it's on Kevin Samuels, it's on, all, I, I'm, and half, by the way, I, I know I keep harping on those channels. There's at least another dozen channels that are picking up on that same template where we see the women come in and they ask, what do you want in a guy? And every aspect or every characteristic that they mention in a, in a guy that would be a good long-term partner for them. They never talk about like who they want it, the hot guy in the foam cannon party. They never, they don't talk about that guy that they want to have sex with immediately right then and there. They, if you ask a woman, what is it that you're looking for in a man? They're going to say, oh, he's got to be funny. He's got to have, well, usually it's money, right? That's the first thing he's got to have money or he's got to have potential for that. He's got to have, and, and to have money, 
You've got to have passion. You've got to have ambition. You've got to have a drive. And what I find ironic about this is the same guy that they think is a high value man, which we talked about last week, that guy, for him to have that ambition, for him to have that single-minded drive, that becomes the other woman. That becomes what she has to compete with. And so when, when women on, in one breath will say, I want a guy who's got a lot of, who's got money, potential to get money, um, who's already made or looks like he's about to be made, he looks like he, you know, he's doing his residency at the, at the hospital and he's going to be a surgeon. Uh, he's going to, he's going to make, you know, partner in the law firm. He's, he's a, he's a law student right now, but it looks like he's going to be a star, you know, lawyer when he gets, you know, gets in, finally hits his stride, like probably in his mid thirties, right? Those characteristics and those qualities are what make that guy a potential big fish, a potential of a guy that she wants to sort of lock down when she can get, get to that guy. Now, to have that drive, to have that single-mindedness, to have that, that uh, like focus and, and intent of purpose, that means that she's going to be sublimated. She's going to come second. But like I said, in one breath, that's what she says she wants. And in another breath, she says, well, he's got to bring me flowers. He's got to treat me right. And I'm a queen. I'm a queen. I'm a, pr it's not, it's no longer, you notice it's no longer a princess. <laughs> I'm a princess. No, you're not. Yield to the princess Nat is now I'm a queen. That's what it is. <laughs> so if you, if that's what you think you deserve, and that's what most women will say that they deserve, what they're really looking for in a high value guy is a big fish. They're looking for a Bill Gates. They're looking for a, a Jeff Bezos. Now those guys are kind of nerds, right? They're kind of autistic. They're kind of like socially, you know, asocial. They're, they don't have the social intelligence that um, that a rapper that a rapper does or, or a star athlete does or somebody who has some sort of like sexy fame. You can be you can be famous online. It's easy to be famous online. Everybody is right. Um, but to be famous for something, to have a talent, to have a skill set, to be known for your greatness and your mastery of something, there's different subcategories of that. So if you're the best, greatest, most famous you know, computer coder in the world, that's a little less sexy than if you are the star running back for the Oakland or for, for the Las Vegas Raiders. Um, so, so what's happening here is it's not so much about women waiting at the finish line and, and banging the winners. It's women going, okay, I can't, I can't wait to get to, I can't wait into my thirties and hope that there, that the guy that I want to get with is going to still want to get with me. Because when, again, when we look at um, the sexual market value um, uh, bell, bell curves that I've done, uh, the uh, sexual market value um, graph, my infamous graph now, women's sexual market value peaks right around 22, 23 years old. For men, it peaks usually right around 36, 37, 38. If you are maximizing your potential, yes, caveat, caveat, caveat. Okay, got it. However, I think it's pretty much common knowledge that men hit their stride and become more mature and be hit their, their most successful years at least eight to 10 years later than a woman is already hitting hers. So either that woman is looking, has the, the, the insight and the foresight to say, hey, I'm gonna get with a guy now while I'm 23 years old and he looks like he's 27 or 28 and he's not quite hitting his stride. He's not made partner in the law team yet but he looks like he might, that's a good bet. That's a, that's a, um, it's like a, what is it? A, it's not a put, no, it's, not, it's, it's like investing, right? It's like, I'm, I'm investing in a stock that I think is gonna mature and that I'm, go, that I'm gonna actually get dividends from if I invest my attraction, my, my, my younger, hotter, tighter years in this guy right now. He, he might be 27, but by the time he's 37, then he'll be made. Women would, well, hypergamy in general, but women's mating strategy would love if Rich Cooper's prognostication was, was true. And in some cases it is. I'm not, I'm not saying that it can't be or it wouldn't be. But what I'm saying is that most women can't wait for you to be the winner. They can't wait for a guy to get to the checkered flag. So they have to make bets. They have to look for potential. They have to find some guy who has prospects. It would be great if you could find like sort of a turnkey relationship like oh well he looks like well look at him he's got like there's very few justin biebers right there oh he's young and he's cute and he's hot he's talented and he's got a lot of money and he's famous and da, 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 da. there's only one of those dudes the vast majority of guys that women will say that is their ideal guy and they're not going to settle for anything less those guys are very very few and far between so 
what you have is you've got the top 20% of guys, maybe even the top 10 or the top 5% of guys who actually have some identifiable ambition, drive, passion, and they're, they're making strides to get to that point where they will be hitting their, their prime years and they're going to hit the ground running and they're going to be winners. They're going to be the guys that go across a checkered flag, like Rich was saying. But most guys, the 85, maybe 90% of guys aren't that, aren't that guy. They might have the potential to be that guy. Like how many Bill Gates are there? How many Steve Jobs? How many Elon Musk's? How many Jeff Bezos? Most women today wouldn't have anything to do with a Jeff Bezos, but rewind the tape, go all the way back to like what, 1998? I think that's when Amazon started, very close. Let's just keep going, let's go back to 1998. Sounds good, 25 years, 23 years ago. So you go back to that time and now you've got Mackenzie Bezos, who is the secretary, or she's just sort of like, you know, oh, here's a startup. It's, and this is, remember, this is the dot-com bubble too. And she sees this guy, he's probably not very attractive, but she's kind of like, you know, quirky and, and nerdy and kind of not as a, certainly not a, a, a catch, right? That's why I call it a big fish, right? But he looks good enough and he's got his, he's got, you know, uh, it looks like he, he might have the drive to do something, but he's certainly got talent. He's certainly positioned in the right space and he's autistic and he's nerdy and he's dorky and he, he would be, I mean, even Bill Gates would have been an incel today. So would Jeff Bezos. So would Elon Musk. You take those guys, you take the, the 15 year old version of and I mean that. Let's say the 20 year old version of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and even Steve Jobs and all those guys, and you put them in 2021, they're incels. They're they're the guys who are grinding their teeth, going, oh, oh we're never gonna score, we're never gonna score. That that's and maybe they're really good at something, but their their self-esteem is kind of crushed because they're that self-esteem is sort of wrapped up in whatever it is they are or like what, you know, we got the, uh, a bad draw, right? We got the short end of the stick uh, socially and physically and everything else. But now they, you know, you get a, a guy like um, Bill Gates, you get a guy like uh, particularly Jeff Bezos, they get with a girl earlier on. I mean, if you know the story, I'm going to read this. Actually, this is a good time to read this. So I'm going to put this up right here because this is how um, Bill Gates, let's put him up there our good friend bill where'd he go there he is that's bill gates now bill gates is that's a very young bill gates right there on the uh here let me let me blow that up even bigger that's a very young that's not too much bigger but that, that's a very young bill gates right there let me see if i can expand this i guess i can't so Anyways, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to read this little, this is a little clip. I, I believe I picked this up from people or I, I can't remember where I got this. But anyways, this is an, a, an interview about how Bill and Melinda Gates started dating. Okay. So this is really quick. So bear with me. Uh, originally, when Bill and Melinda started dating, the relationship was casual for both of them. Of course it was. Look at the dude. If you took that guy, if you took Bill Gates picture, the one that's on the left right there, when he's probably... He's got to be in his 20s. Maybe he's even younger than that. He might even be like 19 right there. I'm not really sure because I know these I know guys like Jobs and, and, and Gates got started early in life. You know, when it comes to like, you know, creating computers, Microsoft, all that stuff. I, it, I don't have to describe to you what his history is. But if you took his picture and you put it on Tinder right now <laughs> or you took it and you put it on any dating profile, does this guy get swiped? What? Right. Or whatever. Does, do women select this guy? No, they don't. But he's the he's one of, if not the richest, uh, what number two, number three richest man in the world right now. If, if that guy does not look like the guy that the girls on Fresh and Fit podcast or whoever, you know, whatever podcast you want, are going to say, yeah, I want to get with that guy. I want to give that dude a chance. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, she had other boyfriends, and I had Microsoft. Sound like ambition, sound like drive, sound like, oh, I'm going to do this. Sound like single-mindedness. I'm more interested in my software company than I am in getting with this chick. Now, guys are going to say, well, isn't that a good thing? Isn't it a good that he was, he, he, well, I mean, he's the richest man in the world. He had Microsoft. Yeah, that is a good thing. But he didn't know that at that time. And so his, his, his sort of his drive, it's not, there's nothing wrong with being ambitious, but you have to remember, we're, we're looking at this like after the war has been won. So when Microsoft was, was you know, in its infancy, let's just say. Now, I'm not saying it wasn't a good company back, like, say, in the late 80s, early 90s. But 
it wasn't what it is today. And he was, he's not the household name, easily recognizable figure that he is today. So Bill says, we were like, hey, we're not really serious about each other, are we? We aren't going to demand each other's time, quote unquote. Plus, Melinda says, I was new, <laughs> I was new to Microsoft. Sound like Mackenzie Bezos? Uh, there were a lot of men and, there and uh, you are still looking around. Uh, but after a year, after about a year, um, sort of to our surprise, certainly my surprise, he said, hey, I love you. <laughs> Bill said, and she uh, said she loved me. And uh, then it was like, wow, and that's what's going to happen. And it, again, it's just sort of this, I love how they try to make it sweet and sappy, like it's just sort of this matter of fact thing, but it's really not. When you look at that, and you see what's happening there. It's a it's a guy who doesn't have the social skills. He has no game, like what? Well, no game, no formal game. Let's just say, but and he has at that point probably had prospects, and so she was probably more than okay with that. But then, yet we're still seeing right now, even to this day, that Bill Gates never gave up his. He's like a, he's like an alpha widow, right? He he never gave up his ex. And I would argue that if Bill Gates wasn't Bill Gates, he wouldn't be getting with either of those girls right now. So there are factors that have nothing to do with the uh, with the social skills of that guy, with the uh, the phys the physique of that guy, <laughs> the the uh, you know hot guy in the foam counterpart, right? That the the arousal factor of that guy that have anything to do with that. But a lot of money covers a multitude of sins. Now, again, you don't want to lead with your wallet. I understand that. Yes, is that and it's not it's not going to buy you genuine desire, as we can probably see right here. Bill's genuine desire was for that or that probably his original girlfriend and that probably I'm, I'm going to speculate here. OK, I don't know. I'm spitballing with this. I would say that the girlfriend, the, the one I showed just a minute ago, I would say that the girlfriend was the girl that he really wanted to, to get with at some point in his youth. And that wasn't working out for him. And Melinda was sort of just there and they were dating a little bit off and on. Um, again, this is back in the, probably in, I would assume it's like in the early nineties. Um, Microsoft's a new company. She's a new employee. Uh, there's other guys that are interested in her. He probably didn't think too much of her because his focus, his single-minded, probably one-itis was still focused on the ex-girlfriend. So much so that once he got married, his, his, he worked out an arrangement with Melinda to go and most likely nail his ex-girlfriend once a, once a year. And, and I will tell you this is, I don't think that's Melinda's idea. I, I, I'm pretty comfortable in saying that that was probably not Melinda's idea. It was just his sort of reality distortion bubble. I'm going to go and have this, like he probably thought that that would, he would justify his, um, his lack of desire or whatever with Melinda by saying, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to nail this girl once, once a, uh, once a year. And she was probably okay with that because at that point, it certainly probably looked like Bill Gates was going to be the richest guy in the world. If not, you know, number two or number three. So they're together. Melinda, of course, turns into something else. If you look at the pictures of Melinda back in the 90s and where she is right now and how she dresses, how she holds herself, you can see she is the primary. She holds frame in that relationship. And he does what he does, uh, you know, talk, whatever you want to talk about. I'm, I don't care about the personal life of, of Bill Gates right here. I'm just identifying this archetype and this, this story arc right here because you see you will see this happen not just in his life, but in Jeff Bezos' life, in, in Bill Gates' life, in, in even um, Steve Jobs' life too. His wife was just sort of a, an accoutrement, right? It was just, he, she was just there to, I mean, his second, you know, the, not the one he had actually his, his first daughter Lisa with, but like the, the, the woman that he actually married. And I think when you put guys into that position, it's like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I, I, I sent out this tweet sort of as a preview or as a sort of, you know, to tease today's show. And that tweet said, um, rich men can't afford to not take, you know, not take the, the red pill. They essentially is what it was. Uh, rich men uh, can afford to um, not learn lessons that they need to learn until they get to a point where they're, they're cutting, you know, half cutting their, their assets in half. Now the joke of course, with Jeff Bezos is he's the richest man in the world. And in fact, he paid uh, Mackenzie Bezos $33 billion in their divorce settlement. And he's still the richest man in the world. 
That was just a, that was a, my, probably a minor inconvenience to him. Okay. <clears throat> now all you conspiracy theorists, here's your chance. I have actually read the, uh, the articles or whatever you want to throw at me. This, let's just say the speculations here that the reason why Jeff Bezos split with uh, Lauren Dirty Sanchez was that it was an asset protection plan. Now he got, well, I should say split. He got with Lauren, but he split from McKenzie. $33 billion. Now, people were saying that he was doing this because uh, I guess recently he sold off a lot of Amazon stock because he sees something coming down the tunnel. He sees the train coming down the economic tunnel right now and is pr- trying to separate his... Uh, at least present the appearance that he, it, his, uh, let, let's say his selling or his moving his assets around is as a result of a nasty divorce. Um, I know that a lot of people are also trying to make comparisons uh, or tr- at least we'll, we'll see how the cards sort of shake out with, with Bill and Melinda Gates here. But they're also saying that the reason he's doing this is because he also sees that the economic forecasts coming down the road here are going to be pretty grim. And he's going to be on the sharp end of the stick here if he doesn't do if he doesn't do things like this. And I thought that was it. Now I don't know. Again, this is conspiracy theory, whatever. And I'm not going to put on my tinfoil hat. I'm not Alex Jones. Um, I let I let those guys handle those topics. Okay. I will say this, however, is that when when rich couples split, I think that it is an indictment on the state of marriage right now that divorce is an asset protection scam for guys that are this rich to say, you know what, honey, I know we've been together for 25 years, um, but we're going to get raked over the coals from, you know, taxes or from the economy is going to, going to, you know, drop out, you know, the bottom's going to drop out. And now divorce is our best option because, you know, Hey, I still love you. We'll still be married. You know, I, you know, I love you. Know, we'll still sleep in the same bed. We'll still sleep in the same house. I'm not saying that that's what they're doing, but I'm just saying, the plan could work that way because, and I'll explain the opposite side of this here in just a second, but like, so when you have a divorce, divorce is so screwed up or marriage, I should say, and divorce are such a racket right now that they can become tax shelters. So if you split your assets up or you can protect your assets, um, you can just say, Hey, uh, we're going to, div- it's essentially what the, what your marriage is, is a, is a, a corporation and you're divesting your corporation with a, your your woman, right? Now she can go do whatever the hell she wants to anyways, because that's the way divorce divorce laws work. It's an unconscionable contract. Bill and Melinda Gates did not have a prenuptial agreement. And why would they? Because when they got married, he was not the Bill Gates of 2021. He was the Bill Gates of what, 1995 or something like that. So Windows 95 is out versus everything that's happened between 95 and 2021. Still, should have done it probably i don't know how effective prenuptial agreements really are um especially for very rich people there's ways around them and if you have enough money and you have the the a dirty enough lawyer you can certainly do that i'm sure there's probably a team of attorneys right now who are just foaming at the mouth at settling this case uh, people are saying it'll never go to arbitration it'll never go to court though it'll, it'll be settled out of court and i 100 percent agree with that um, so you're never going to, it's never going to go before a judge because it's cheaper just to simply just, you know, separate, but whether it's true or whether it's not, I think it's still an indictment on the state of marriage and the industry that the <laughs> divorce incorporated, right? That it is a viable form of asset protection for very rich, very rich men, or it could be now most guys will say, well, you'll get ripped off into you'll lose half your stuff. Yeah. Yeah. If you're an average guy, if you're even if you if, even if you're an above average guy, you'll probably still get zeroed out in some some way, shape, or form. That's that's why the joke was, you know, Jeff Bezos, uh, you know, he's the richest man in the world, paid thirty three billion dollars, and he's still the richest man in the world and still making money hand over fist, actually, because of twenty twenty and COVID. But so that's the one side of it. The other side of it that I I think is interesting, and we're seeing the same narratives get thrown out right now, is the fact that. Um, in a gynocentric social order, when high profile people get divorced, such as Kanye West, such as Bill and Melinda Gates, uh, I, like name the high profile couple 
that has a lot of money, has some kind of fame, maybe they're actors, maybe they're athletes, maybe they're computer whizzes, whatever it is, whoever has the most money and they're high profile and they have their, their household name. Whenever there's a divorce in a gynocentric social order and you're looking at that, there's the focus becomes on marriage. Let's look at marriage. Why? Why? They were so happy. They seemed like they were steady and stable and da 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 da, da. And that's where Mr. MGTOW, Mr. Black Pill, Mr. Doomer, Mr. whatever jumps in and says, well, they can't work for them. And oh, okay, what chance do I have? Okay, well, that's the obvious thing. Now, the reason why you think that is because the focus at that point, once that divorce happens, you're real. By the way, if that's what your initial thought was when you see high profile divorces, like, oh, I could never work for me. Congratulations. You're part of the gynocentric social order. You're getting that message from women who are saying exactly the same thing, just from their own perspective. So when you have uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, or I love this, when um, when McKenzie split from Jeff Bezos, every woman on the in the Twitter sphere, every woman on social media jump behind her like as quick as they possibly could. And of course, what do they do? They rationalize everything. They say, well, Mackenzie was there and she helped him start. She was an integral part of Amazon. And I'm like, <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Yeah, she she probably owned some stock, right? And she probably had something to do with the, at least the initial success because she was there and she was supporting him. But was she supporting him to the tune of 33 billion with a B billion dollars? No. If they if if they divested, if if they completely said, "Okay, um, Amazon's bankrupt or we're, we're going to divest the company. We're just going to completely, you know, break it down into little companies whatever." And you all you big wigs, everybody who has uh, stock right now, you've got to sell off your stock or we're going to give you the money for your stock right now. Do you think that the amount of stock that that Mackenzie Bezos would own even in Amazon, just in, in the company that she supposedly was instrumental in? Do you think that it would amount to $33 billion if they said, oh, well, I'm, I'm out, so I guess I'll take my shares and go home. And that doesn't amount to $33 billion for McKinsey Bezos. Sorry, not sorry. But the reason why you get those rationales is because it shines an unflattering light on the marriage industry. It shines a very unflattering light on, um, on, on Jeff Bezos. But it all, but that's what they, because they'll look for anything, any reason. It's all the reason that they're looking for the divorce is, well, now, and you've got it right now. Thank God I waited. You've got uh, Bill Gates with his ex girlfriend. And, well, this is a little weird. He's nailing her in this North Carolina beach resort once a year. And, she, and Melinda's cool with that. Divorce him. She deserves that money, whatever it ends up being. The same thing's going to happen. Well, the same thing happened, I should say, with, with, uh, with Mackenzie Bezos. Because what do they do? They focus on Lord, Dirty Lauren San Dirty Sanchez, Dirty Lauren Sanchez, forty nine years old, and you got uh, Jeff Bezos, who I think is 55, 56, something where somewhere around there, um, and he's getting with Lauren Sanchez, who is a predatory female. And what do they do? What is the gynocentric, uh, salacious uh, paparazzi press? What does TMZ look at? They look at Jeff Bezos and the and what's and it's poor, poor Mackenzie. Poor, poor her. It was one of the, uh, if not the biggest divorce settlement up to that time. I will, you know, Melinda Gates, uh, you know, the meme right now is like, you know, Melinda Gates, hold my beer, right? <laughs> well, we'll see if she outdoes um, uh, Mackenzie Bezos for uh, the divorce settlement. But why do they do that? Because they want to, uh, a gynocentric press, a gynocentric a media wants to remove the focus from divorce, from marriage, from the resource transfer and the unconscionable contract that is the state of our modern marriage right now and focus it on the people and the personalities. And usually that's the guy, right? Jeff Bezos couldn't keep his dick in his pants. Ha, film at 11. Oh, but here's the thing. Mackenzie Bezos became, I think, the fourth richest woman in the world as a result of divorce. <laughs> uh, and Forbes did a, uh, and at that time I was reading this article, Forbes, Forbes did this article. I think it was either right before that or right after that, where they were looking at the 60 richest women on planet earth, like in, 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 in of all time. Right. So, uh, of those 60, only four of the women on that list actually were self-made millionaires or billionaires. 
all of the rest, what, 60 or excuse me, 56 of the, of the 60 had made their money either from uh, inheriting it, inheriting the business, or they had made that money as a result of a divorce. And Mackenzie Bezos drops right into that. In fact, m the majority made their money in a divorce. They took half of their husband's assets, half of their husband's, uh, actually in some cases, even more than that, and assumed the role of that. Now, if they were married to the guy who was like a, a oil tycoon or whatever, who was a, 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 a top shelf businessman and he died and she took, she assumed the, uh, the mantle of leadership. She's the C now that she's the CEO that that would be considered as hereditary. So it's not like her dad died and she picked up the, the business. In some cases it's true, but it's, it's, it's passed along. It's not built. And that goes along with uh, the Manosphere uh, maxim that men must become and women just are. And when women just are, they make their money and they make their six, they have, they become strong, independent women, right? And they become enriched and they become empowered as a result of two things, inheriting it or divorce. Those are the two major things. Statistically, this is, this is incontrovertible. You can look at the stats for this and see it. In fact, even in a, a publication like Forbes or Morgan, you know, when Morgan Stanley does this, you know, stats and stuff like that. When you look at that, that those are, tend to be fairly conservative, you know, they're economic, you know, financial uh, publications. They want to promote the, the gynocentric social order. And they don't even realize that by making those stats public, they're kind of going against their own sort of internal narratives that are going there. But in a gynocentric social order in, uh, in mainstream press, the focus is always on, not on the divorce, not on marriage, but on, or, but they'll look at why things didn't work out. Like they, like they are, they're doing for, um, for Melinda and Bill Gates. You look at Bill Gates and you go, okay, he's not Jason Momoa. Okay. He's not, he's not running around. He's not Dan Bilzerian. He's not, he doesn't have like a bunch of hotties in Maui that he's banging on a catamaran somewhere. Okay. <laughs> He is Bill Gates and yeah, maybe he's still got one itis for his ex-girlfriend from way back in the day, but you know, he, he's not, he's not prime choice red meat. Let's put it that way. Jeff Bezos, he could be because he's an arrogant son of a bitch and, and right. And maybe rightly so. Right. But he's, he's got, he's cocky. He's, and so he's easier for, I think a gynocentric press to really kind of dig their claws into Elon Musk. When Elon Musk posts on Twitter, like, you know, take the red pill and he's, and he trolls, he, uh, he, he's a very good troll. Let's just say that if he's got Asperger syndrome, at least he's a good troll. At least he's an entertaining troll. <laughs> But he's with Grimes. He's had God knows how many wives. What he's got four wives. He was with Amber Heard, right? Um, how many kids does he have? He's not even married to Grimes and she's got one kid with him as well. So at least he's not marrying her. Maybe he learned his lesson in that respect, but he's still going to, he's still on the hook and he's Elon Musk and he's like, whatever, I can afford it. That's why I, I posted rich men will never learn the lessons that they need to learn, particularly when it comes to the blue pill. And that's where I want to go with there, or a little bit more with this here. Um, just to, let me just finish this thought. The, the thought was this, is that when we see high profile divorces, the mainstream media will always focus on the guy and his infidelity, his philandering, uh, the dead alligator heads that he keeps in the refrigerator or whatever it is that, that will make you think that he's the bad guy. And the woman is like, oh, look, Mackenzie Bezos is giving, uh, what, she got 33 billion. She's giving 7 billion to women's, uh, you know, empowerment studies in Rwanda and, you know, give us back our girls, you know, whatever it is. That seems like a, a, a full, since she's the real philanthropist, it's not Jeff, it's not Bill. And you'll see the same narrative follow Melinda Gates after this. Once, once the dust has settled and once the cars have shaken out to wherever the hell they're going, you will see that the, all the positivity will go towards Melinda and not towards Bill. And honestly, probably Bill's okay with that. <laughs> like he just probably wants to do his own thing. And I would, I would say that. So here's, here's what going to be my, my, my prognostication here. Melinda will be seen as the hero. She will probably be seen as the real philanthropist in the couple. And you will also see that, um, uh, Bill, Bill will probably drop out for a little while, but watch what he does. I would argue that he probably will try to get back with the ex-girlfriend and the ex-girlfriend will see him as a big fish and try to get with him as well. So when you have, um, when you have 
well, predatory females is one thing, but when you have just women who are like making a bet on a future big fish and it actually pans out and they go, holy shit, I got the biggest fish in the ocean right now. Yeah, they're going to stick with that and they're going to be okay with that. And they're, uh, the, the whole uh, discussion uh, on, um, you know, Fresh and Fit or, or Kevin Samuels or whatever about how is it okay for a high value man to cheat? Well, here you have Bill Gates, who is a technically cheating at least one week a year. He's got a hall pass, right? He can go and nail his ex-girlfriend and Melinda will just, okay, I guess I'll just go to Bible study for a week and, you know, give money to homeless children. Um, so when the shit hits the fan, I'll be okay. <laughs> now, so he looks a little weird. Yes, I also know. He spent time on Epstein Island. Okay, let do, I, I give it to you. Here you go. There, oh, Rollo said it. Yay. Okay, fine. You, whatever. Yeah, yeah, I know. Got it. Maybe he's a little weird. There's a lot of people who are a little weird. He's a lot weird. So there's that aspect of it. But when it comes to uh, waiting at the finish line for the winner, waiting for the finish line, the big fish, that is something that women have to make a, a judgment call on. And that's why they defer. That's why you want to know why dread is such a, such a, uh, a put a, a very effective form of game. That's why, because women have to bet on their future or bet their, their, their as attractive and as arousing as they are there, the younger, hotter, tighter, they have those years. They have to bet those years, the value of their sexual market value peak years on the future projected value of the big fish or what they think is going to be the big fish. Now, if you are already a big fish and you're still blue pill and you're still beta, you are a target, my friend. If you're a 70 year old guy or a 60 year old guy and you find yourself divorced or whatever, and you're trying to get back into the now, you know, what is it? Say 40 years later, you're trying to get into the sexual marketplace and, and things have changed and you're looking for help. I'm not saying that there aren't, you know, there, are, there isn't help out there for you. Please. I like to think I would help you. I like to think reading my books would help you as well. I have had guys who I've done counseling with who are as old as 70 years old. Um, some, in some case, 172, I think. And the first thing I tell these guys is you are a big fish. You need to protect yourself and your assets and your heart and your way of thinking about it. you have to, you need to re-educate yourself. You need to unlearn 40, 45, maybe in some cases, 50 years of your blue pill conditioning. And that's tough for them to do, especially when they've got a lot of money and they go, Hey, the proof's in the pudding. I got, look how much money I have in the bank account. I might've lost a bit on the, the, the divorce, but look, the numbers don't lie. I must be, I must be a badass because I've got, you know, I've got what I have. Yeah, you are. You're also a big fish and you're also a prime mark for a predatory female. And I don't care if you're Bill Gates or you're just a guy who has had a established business in the town. You never left since high school and you make a good chunk of change at that. Maybe you, I don't know, you have a heating and air conditioning business or something and you're the best, most, you know, well-respected, richest guy in town as a result of just, you know, you know, playing your cards the right way. Now you find yourself divorced um, because she, you know, she doesn't want to live with you or your kids are out, you're empty nesters now, and you're going to be a, I don't want to say a victim, but you're, you're a statistic of gray divorce. And so now you find yourself back in the sexual marketplace and guys in this position, guys, they're one of the toughest things that I've experienced. And I'm going to give you, here's the anecdotes that I'm going to give you today. One of the toughest things that I've experienced with guys who are very wealthy that I have worked with and I have partnered with in my, in my business and my economic past, let's just say, um, they tend to be very blue pill because they don't have an instance to learn anything that is red pill because why would they, they, they also, most guys who are in the position of say a guy like Bill Gates or it doesn't have to be him, but like guys who are rich guys who are that big fish profile, they tend to find their, they, they, they base their self-worth and their self-merit and their self-esteem on being a high value guy, right? I make a lot of money. So I must be, the way I think and my belief set must be the right thing to think. And with regard to women, with regard to, to life, with regard to raising my kids, with regard to, you know, my politics, with regard to my religion, everything else. If I have this prosperity, then what I've been doing must be right. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, now you're in a divorce and it's something, at least a part of it broke. 
and you're going, well, why should I listen to this Rolo Tomasi schmuck? Why should I listen? To, why should I read his book? Why should I get in the red pill? The, they sound like misogynists to me. Um, you know, and I've been, I've been pretty successful for most of my life. And the guy is still very, very blue pill. And he might even be an alpha, but he's still a blue pill alpha, but he's not going to, he, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And if you don't have occasion to learn those lessons and you're insulated from learning those lessons as a result of your success and your prosperity, you're even in a tougher spot because you're never, no one is going to be able to tell you shit. They're, they're afraid to tell you no. I have known millionaires, I mean, and, and in some cases, multimillionaires who they will go through pretty much their entire life without anybody ever telling them, no, you can't do that. And the minute they do, they lose their shit and they cry and they, they screech and they, yeah, that's when the autistic side of them really comes out. That's how you know, by the way, I should say that as well. I learned this from personal experience is that you will not know a person, especially if it's somebody who's your, your business partner or somebody who you work for or somebody who you have even some kind of respect for. The moment you say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. No, I, 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 I vote no for that. The moment you do that and you tell them no, a person who has never been told that or is very rarely told that and they, and they, they turn into a 12-year-old petulant child, that, when somebody tells you and shows you who they are, believe them the first time. That's all I'm going to say about that. <laughs> However, most of these guys don't, most very rich guys who do everything by the old set of rules and they prosper as a result of that, whether, or maybe in spite of that, when you get them to a point of crisis or where something breaks like their divorce, that's when they maybe want to listen to you. Maybe that the, there's sort of a hesitancy there at least because they, they know they want to get back in the game and they need somebody to give them, so to sort of advise them about the new sexual marketplace. But there's a hesitancy and that hesitancy comes from having learned the blue pill and learned a form of game that is based on transaction. First of all, they're, they're most of these guys, I got certainly Bill Gates, certainly Jeff Bezos. So I would also argue probably Elon Musk um, have a, a very firmly embedded uh, understanding of intersexual dynamics that is based and founded on transactional sex. It's not based on validational sex. In fact, the, if the, their entire groove, their entire game is built on one side of hypergamy, which is the beta buck side. Have a lot of money, have a lot of assets, have a lot of friends or have status. Um, uh, what the three P's, uh, protection, provisioning, and parental investment. Um, and then have that in spades, have that so much, have so much money that it covers the deficits of anything else you could possibly have. And if you're okay with the transactional side, you're never going to learn the red pill. You're never going to be red pill aware. Or if you are, you're going to reject it and you have a real tough time accepting it. That's for sure. But and I will tell you this right now, if you're an older man and you're watching this right now and you're between the ages of say 45 and 65, or maybe 75, we can even go that far. If, if you're that guy and you're trying to get, you're, you're uh, just this side of a divorce and you're trying to get back into the game and whatever else, you need to bust yourself down to apprentice level. That's what Robert Greene talks about in his book, Mastery. Most guys won't do that. They want to learn something. They want to master something. They want to get back on the, on the horse and ride, but they don't, they, they have a sense of ego. They have a sense of, of self, let's just say that, um, that prevents them from doing that. Because, and why would they, right? They were very, real, they go to work and everybody says, yes, 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 yes. Money, money, money. Here, oh, look, I'm profiting, so I must be doing something right. Screw this guy. I'm not going to bust myself down for anybody. Well, the problem is, is you will be a prime mark for the next Lauren Sanchez. You'll be a prime mark for the next girl who said, who sees you for what you are. You're a beta chump with a lot of money. You're a big fucking fish. And that's a, and, and you know what? There are other predatory women that are swimming around you too because they know you're a big fish. They'll fight amongst each other to try to get to you. I'm going to fucking better than you. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I will. No, and then they will try to get to the point because especially when it's a woman who is like just this side of 40, who's, who's definitely out of the, out of the sexual marketplace, uh, has hit the wall per se. Let's, let's just go there. Um, 40, 43, 45, uh, Lauren Sanchez, 49 years old. And she's just this side of menopause too, if not already, you know, perimenopausal at that point. 
And a guy like Jeff Bezos looks at her and goes, yeah, I want to get with that. Where does that come from? Most guys are dumbfounded by that, by the way. When, when that went on, and I will be, when you look at, I can just give you this example right now. When you look at uh, Bill Gates getting with his ex-girlfriend, she's not that much to look at. She probably rocks his world and he, he's probably still got one itis for her. And he probably still thinks that she's his soulmate. And he probably buys into a lot of that blue pill crap. Certainly a soulmate. Oh, I knew she was the one, but I couldn't have her. And now she probably divorced. And he's already married to Melinda, but he wants to still nail his ex-girlfriend because he's technically the alpha widow in this case. Or she, she's the one that got away. But now, because he's got so much bloody money, he can go and have whatever the hell he wants. So what does he choose? He doesn't have hot swimsuit models on the catamaran like Dan Blitzerian. He gets, he gets with this girl. He gets with this chick right here. And the, so this is, this is the ideal chick for, um, for Bill Gates, apparently. Now, you can, like, we can make physical comparisons, but like we're, we're talking about, these are mortals, right? These are, these are, uh, you know, average women. Even Melinda Gates is an average woman, or she was certainly when she was younger. And you look at this girl right here, this is probably from, I mean, I don't, I don't know how old the shot is, but this is something I pulled off recently. Um, and I don't even know this chick's name and I don't care to know her name. All I can say is that if that's what he's going back to, or if, if Jeff Bezos is going to Lauren Sanchez, he's probably blue pill. He's probably got, so he probably thinks that that's the right thing to do. Well, the monkey doesn't reach for another branch or unless he, or let go of the branch unless he get she gets to the next one or he gets to the next one. We talk about monkey branching in women all the time. Guys will do it too, especially rich guys, because they can afford to screw it up. Jeff Bezos could afford a $33 billion divorce. He could probably aff afford four of them if he wanted to. You know, if that's what he chose to do with his money, he's not going to do that. But he could and probably snap back from it. He's he. I, I don't know how much he has made or Amazon has made. I know he stepped down as, and yes, I know he stepped down as the CEO of, of Amazon. So my, my warning to you guys is the mon that money is most definitely not an insurance policy against the blue pill, against your blue pill conditioning, against being a beta, against being a guy who in any other, under any other normal circumstance, Bill Gates would never be even with Melinda or this other girl, right? He'd probably be at home jerking it off. He'd probably be dead, to be honest with you. And I don't mean that. I don't wish death on him or anything. I'm just saying that most guys between the ages of 45 and 65 years old, that's a prime demographic, especially white men in, in particular, that's a prime demographic for suicides. And when do those suicides come? Right after a divorce. So he's got enough money to be insured against that. He probably doesn't care too much that Melinda is, and by the way, Melinda did initiate the divorce. So that's another statistic that you're going to see the gynos, the femstream press, the gynocentric media is going to you know, casually sweep under the carpet. And they'll say, well, it was mutual. No, she filed for divorce. Sorry, not sorry. That's the, that's the facts. So when people start, when, when women start talking about how, oh, well, you know, she deserves that money or blah, blah, blah. Well, she initiated the divorce. It's not a mutual thing. It's not, oh, give a, please give us our privacy. You know where she went, by the way, for, to get her privacy? She went to a private island that is apparently $132,000 a day, a week or a day. I don't even know. She's there sort of convalescing, right? She's like, you know, with her girlfriends crying in her, you know, apple teenies. <laughs> Whatever. She's probably happy as, as a pig and shit right now. But, you know, what do we know? What do us plebes know <laughs> about that kind of stuff? So my, my, the moral of this story is, is, as I was saying, is if you're a blue pill guy and you have a lot of money, you are probably insulated from a lot of this stuff. If you have, if you've got assets in excess of like $10 million, right? Or yeah, assets in $100 million. The, the more money that you have, the likelihood of you being more insulated against um, seeing anything from a, a, a red pill perspective with respect to intersexual dynamics with the wife that maybe you married when you were poor, right? When, we, you're, when you weren't a big fish, now you're a big fish. Now you do have that kind of money. I mean, I, I realize that in some ways that's kind of like an apex fallacy. Like, oh, well, I'm going to be super rich, so I'm going to need a, 
I'm going to need a prenup. No, guys don't get prenups because they go, well, you know, what am I going to be? They, they don't have that kind of foresight. You know, they're not aiming for the moon, right? <laughs> um, but remember that if you do and you happen to be single and the more you lose your kind of mind about things, the easier a mark you are. And women look for that, especially women who are motivated to look for that. So if you're if, if if you're dealing with a like a personal trainer or a physical therapist or whatever, and she's a hot piece of ass, and she's like maybe like 29 or 30 or something like that, that's one thing. And you're probably not going to get with that chick. But if she see and and maybe she wants to get with you, maybe she doesn't. You're 50, you're 60, you've got a lot of money, and you think you're the shit because you have that money. You're putting yourself. You're basically saying, "Hey, here I am. Here's the big target right here. I'm a mark. Come on and get me, ladies." And women will go, will come and get you because by the time they get to uh, the reason I wanted to sort of escalate their or age this turn the you know let's let's put the scroll bar up a little bit when you, when a woman gets to be about forty and she's single and she's on Tinder you know likelihood is that she's got some some kids in tow or whatever she is maybe she's looking f to, you know for the the short term sex I, I talk about this by the way uh, actually this is not a bad time to put this up. Um, this is uh, the timeline of what you can expect from women in at various um, various stages of their maturity. This is from my second book, which is The Rational Male Preventive Medicine. And uh, a lot of people talk about this book as if it's the, um, it is the sort of like a guide, like a field guide almost to what you can expect from women. Now, is it 100% accurate? No, but it's just like sort of gives you an outline of what you can expect from women at these various stages of maturity. And you'll notice that right around the 37 year old mark, right? Um, you'll see an alpha reinterest right there in women. And usually that's, at, that's when women uh, get into the, oh, the one that got away. I wish I was with my soulmate. Uh, the, the cute guy, the hot guy in the foam cannon party that I, I had sex with that one spring break. Uh, I really wish I could get back to that. I'm almost 38, 39. I'm going to divorce this guy and, and do the eat, pray, love thing. It's like Stella got her groove back, right? I'm going to go and, and be, become a cougar, right? Go, you go girl. That's when divorce porn kicks in, right? That's the prime demographic for divorce porn. So that's what I've, uh, sort of loosely labeled the development phase, because what happens is that there becomes sort of a dissatisfaction with that woman's life. And she's saying, Oh, do I really want to live with this guy for the rest of my life? Now, it can happen sooner. It can happen later. Just depends. Sometimes it doesn't happen at all, right? Maybe she got with the guy that she, or maybe she is so unattractive by this point that she's doing the best she can. She is really literally with the best she can do. She acknowledges that. And this doesn't happen, but in a gynocentric social order, in a global sexual marketplace, this happens more often than not because women believe they have more options than they actually do. So right around 37 right there, what I said is it's the, uh, it's the peak uh, sexual market value for men, but right around that same stage is when women sort of have what I call it, you know, the reinterest phase, uh, redevelopment or reinterest, or um, what did I put there? Uh, yeah, so it's reinvestment basically. So right around the development phase and the right after 40 right there, that's when women are reassessing. Do I want to relive the rest of my, did I marry the right guy? Is he the one? Is he, is he the best I can do? Now, hypergamy is always based on that doubt. It's always going to be based on, on, can I do better than this dude? And as long as that answer is always yes, or as long as the answer is, well, I'm not what I used to be, then, you know, you're probably going to be with the chick. You know, it might not be based on genuine desire. It might be based on necessity, but it is what it is. And when a woman gets is get makes that decision says i'm going to divorce this guy she has an incentive to get with a big fish and if a woman has been with a bunch of guys or she's had in her past in her party years as her hoe phase right up through her 30s or whatever and she's been she's had enough beta orbiters and she's had enough experience with guys and she understands male nature well enough to find a guy with a big fish with a lot of money who is still stuck in his beta way of thinking and his blue pill conditioning is a jackpot for a woman like that because she knows how to turn on the charm. She knows how to be sexy for that guy who is in no way used to that kind of stuff, especially if he's a recent divorcee who's been in a sexless marriage for 10, 20 years. All she has to do is be more sexual than the, than the bitch that wouldn't have sex with him in spite of him being this huge big fish. And maybe she took half of it, 
but he still has a lot of money. All that new chick has to do, all the 40 year old girl has to do is be more sexual, more vivacious, more fun, more feminine, um, and play the game better. And the, the bar is so low at that point that it's, it's, it's practically an, uh, you know, an automatic. So it's hitting the win button for a predatory female who understands men's nature. And that's what you have to protect yourself against gentlemen. And that's the moral of today's story. So when I talk about a big fish, are you a big fish? Ask yourself, are you a high value man? We all love to think that we are great. That we think that there's a, a real sense of power and a real sense of sexual selection as a result of that. The only way you get that is if you kill the beta is if you unlearn the blue pill conditioning that you probably have learned and stop being resistant to it. Bust yourself down to apprentice red pill, right? Apprentice game guy, right? Apprentice. Okay. All bets are off. I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm a white belt. I'm going to go learn the, the martial art of game or the martial art of the red pill or the martial art of being more aware of women's nature. And now we have the information and we have the data and we have the, we have the technology, right? We can, we can build the, we can rebuild ourselves as a result of this. That's what you need to do. I've, I've worked with enough guys to do this. I've seen this happen enough. I have known guys, again, personal stories here. I've known guys who are multi wealthy men. Let's just say multimillionaire men. Now, not like God tier, you know, wealth, but let's just say in the tens of millions, I've known guys who have tried to start businesses or try their entrepreneur. They're, they're legitimately bonafide entrepreneurs tried to start new businesses, tried to get angel investors, tried to get this thing, you know, try to get their partners together to, to start a new venture of some sort. And their friends and their, their, they got their previous business partners who helped them out in the past won't have anything to do with them because they're a risk. Now they're divorced and they saw what happened and they saw how that guy works with women and how his, how his, um, and I mean, by work, I mean like interacts with his, his wife and everything he's divorced she took half his assets. She took half of his ownership stakes. He had to buy her out, whatever, because she's got a vested interest in his business because that's the rules, right? That's, that's the all downside rules for you. And they don't want to do business with him because he's still a chump. He's still blue pill and they see it. They don't, they can't even put their finger on it. They won't even call it blue pill. They just don't have anything. He's too much of a risk because I'm not going to go and build another business with this guy. If he's just going to go get married to some other girl who sees him as a big fish, gets him on the hook and says the right things to him. And he's still a chump. He's still a beta. He's still a puss when it comes to his wife and it comes to girls and everything else, because he's a rip. Why would you do that now? I'm now. So I'm going to build another business with you after you've been zeroed out by the first wife. No, they're not going to do that. And I've seen guys do exactly that bail on the, and they, and the guy is pissed off because somebody told him no. And then second of all, he's like, okay, oh, he feels like he's stabbed in the back or he's been betrayed by these guys. Well, they won't, they won't help me out now. No, they just see what you are. They just see what you did. Uh, many, many rich men don't have the occasion to learn women's nature, nor the incentive to do it anyways, because they've got money and they think they're doing it right. Their game is buy the pussy, whether that's rent it, whether that's pay for an escort, whether that's pay for, you know, girls in Maui on your catamaran, or it's buy one chick and pay her and pay her and pay her and pay her. So when you got Melinda Gates here, who probably maybe at some point probably saw that Bill Gates was going to be a big fish. He was probably already a big, probably a bigger fish than she knew of anybody else at that time. She's going to play her cards right. We read the introduction there. She had guys that were already looking at her and wanted to get with her at Microsoft at that time. She knew who he was. If a woman knows you're a beta in waiting, you're like 30 years old. Let's just say for sake, sake of example, let's round the ages off. You're 30 years old. You haven't quite hit your, pro, your, your prime years. You haven't hit your stride just yet. But you're, you're still pretty paid. You're still pretty well off. That woman wants you to be dumb. I've said this before. Like when a woman gets into the epiphany phase, she's looking for what Sheryl Sandberg has said is there's nothing sexier, right? You're looking for a guy who wants an opinionated woman and wants an equal partnership. And an equal partnership means that if you divorce me, I take half of your shit. Um, but the egalitarian side of that, they're looking for a beta. They're looking for a properly conditioned beta who made good. And they're very rare, but they don't, it's not like they don't exist. 
or a guy, a beta who's still a beta and waiting, and he's not quite the big fish, but probably in four or five, maybe six years, if he keeps doing what he's doing, he will be a big fish. Women see that and they make those, they make those projections like stock traders, man, like, like very, like, like freaking boiler room, man. Like, like they understand, uh, um, what is it? Um, the big short, like the guys in there, that's the, that's the predatory female with you. The guys in the big short, you're the short They're You're the, the, the big fish that they're going to screw in the end. They're playing the long game. Now, are they malicious and evil and they, they, oh, this is my plan. Yeah, uh, uh, no, it's just a progression. What well, it's, it's logistics. It just, it, it's common sense. If I can find a guy who's still dumb about the sexual marketplace, but he's done a lot and he's going to make a lot of money or he already has a lot of money and he's so stupid that he doesn't understand the game that he's in. There's lots of women that want to tell him that I get. So I just told you the anecdote about the rich guys and, and how, uh, the women want to yeah, like the older women want to get they're incentivized of course now younger guys so if you're 30 years old you don't even have to be so much of a big fish you have to have the potential for a big fish right but you're a beta and waiting you're 30 years old and what's the first thing these guys report to me when i'm doing counseling with these guys or even maybe just like you'll be in the comment section i have read so, like so many of these incidences that it's like it's a predictive framework now but guys will get to be 30 years old and they'll go Rollo, I can't believe it. You know, the girls that wouldn't have anything to, they wouldn't even give me the time of day when I was 22. That girl who I really wanted to bang back in, you know, one, my freshman year of college or whatever, you know, and she was, you know, fucking the guy in the hot, in the phone cannon party somewhere. But, you know, now that I'm 30, um, she's calling me up. She looked me up on Facebook. We're, we're going to reconnect. We're going to go get coffee today. We're going to have a great time. I'm going to take a rock climb. We're going to go. I'm going to use the red pill on her. No, no, you're not. Because she sees you as the big fish. She the, the chips are down, man. When women get to the 29 to 31 year old demographic right there, they're worried that they're not going to have a partner to walk out of the club with when the lights come on. And you're the dude. <laughs> and they're open about it. They'll say this now. And you have to be aware. You can't be stupid anymore. You have to be educated. You have to be red pill aware protect your assets or ass and your assets and that they'll tell me that those are all these girls man they're coming out of the woodwork well the girls that wouldn't give me the time of day that when i was in high school and freshman year of college and everything else i must be doing something right yeah you are you got a lot of money you got a lot of prospects and she's at their most necessitous point in her entire life because if she doesn't cash her chips in the casino is going to close that's why <laughs> And, and, and guys are just dumbfounded about that because they're still ignorant of the process. They're still ignorant of their value to women. We talked about that in uh, on Rule Zero last week. You know, the most threatening thing for a woman is a man who understands and and capitalizes on his own intrinsic value to women. Women want a man who other men want to be, and other women want to bang. They also want a man who. They don't want a man to cheat, but they want a man, they love a man who could cheat, but they also need a guy who's dumb about that. They need a guy to, to be a sweet and nice and they want Superman, but they want a dumb Superman. They want, and, and, and by dumb and ignorant, I mean, ignorant of women's mating strategy, which is kind of ironic when you think about open hypergamy and just how blatant and in your face and triumphal they are about you know, waving their mating strap. I'm going to have my cake and eat it too and have chocolate sprinkles on it, right? And those are the girls that, you know, the girls who can't do that, the girls who get past the epiphany phase and they haven't found the guy who was ignorant enough to like get with them or ignorant enough to believe that they that they are in some way aroused or, in, in, you know, interested in them suddenly romantically. Why now? Um, those are the girls that Kevin Samuels gets on his show and talks about and, and dresses them down because they missed the boat. The train pulled out and they weren't there still at the station and they, 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 ain't, they ain't coming back. So what are those women looking for now? They're, oh, I want a high value guy. Yeah, of course you do. You want the guy who's already crossed the checkered flag. You want the winner that Rich always talks about. That's what you want. You're not going to get it. Or I shouldn't say you're not going to get it. You're less likely to get it. You know why? Because when a guy gets to be like, if you're 33, ladies, if you're 33 years old and on average, statistical average, you're looking for a guy who's anywhere between three to seven years older than you. 
So if you're 33, you're looking for a guy who is somewhere between what, 36 and 40, somewhere around there. And that guy, if he is the high value guy that is a big fish to you, the likelihood is, is if he's still single, first of all, and he realizes his own value, he's not looking for your, a, a woman in your demographic. Certainly not with your baggage, certainly not with your mindset, certainly not with your attitude, certainly not with everything. Like women have their own blue pill conditioning too, which by the way, ladies, you need to unlearn just as much as guys need to unlearn that. Because we're now in a, we're, we're in the new order. We're not in the old order anymore. So those guys, those guys in their prime demographic, their, their prime sexual market value years are looking for women that are younger, hotter, tighter, of course. They're looking for the girls who wouldn't give them the time of day when they were coming up. And now that they're up and they're hitting their stride, you know, maybe they don't want the 22 year old, but they certainly want the 26 year old. You know, that's something that they can, something I can, they can work with. They don't want the girl who's run through, but they, you know, they don't want an 18 year old girl in Miami Brickell district, right? <laughs> Um, because that they're, they're looking for something that they can build someone they can build with. And that someone is not a 33 year old woman who, ha who has had all that. But if you're a big fish and you find a guy who, or, or excuse me, if you're, if you're a woman who's 33 years old and you find a big fish, you find a guy who's like 36, 37, he's making a lot of money. He's a winner. He's crossed the finish line. The best thing in the world for that woman is that you're dumb and that you are ignorant of the game and you're ignorant of the sexual market, but your own sexual market value. You're humble. You have humility. You don't think you're, you, you actually, in some ways, you might even be self-deprecating because you're still blue pill. You might even be a good looking dude. You might even be like Giga Chad and you might even have a lot of money. You might even be Bill Gates and Giga Chad. And if you're blue pill, you're a mark. And if you're an easy mark, oh shoot, and you, that's icing on the cake for women because that's what they need. You want to know why I always say that men's hit their sexual market value peak right around 36, 37, 38 years old is not because I think that, oh, guys are going to be in their best shape of their lives. No, you're probably in the better shape of your life if you did it right, if you maximize your potential back in your 20s. For sure, I will acknowledge that right now. But the reason why you're in your sexual market value prime is because you have the most or you have the potential to have the most of what women need the most at when they're the most necessitous. <laughs> And that's why they come all come on all sweet and strong to you and they want to make bake you cookies and they want you to settle down and you better do the right thing, mister. You better put a ring on my finger and suddenly they get really kind of self-righteous. And if you're still blue pill and you're a chump and you believe in that same thing, well, you know, I know she's had other guys, but now she wants to get right with God and I'm the guy here and I've stuck to my guns and you make it a moral issue. Yeah, you probably think you're the man, but all you're doing is facilitating her mating strategy. That's what you're doing. So, gentlemen, unlearn that which you unlearn that what you have learned. That's what you have to do. You have to unlearn the blue pill. You have to unlearn that old way of thinking, doing the right, you know, playing by that old set of rules. Because that that's what keeps you ignorant. And the more money you have, the more assets you have, the more talents you have, the more potential you have to make a lot of money to be a big fish, the bigger the mark you're going to be for women who un who are who, who since they were like 10 years old have been understanding the nature of boys and then men and what it is that they do and are they separating the the guys they want to fuck and the guys they want to marry remember my poor girls right would you have sex with the guy on a first date well if he was hot and cute and i was drunk i was drunk he was cute and one thing led to another right but not if he had boyfriend material what he was boyfriend material not if he was you know had it's cads versus dads right and women are upfront and they have no problem with that cognitive dissonance. They'll have sex on the first night in Cancun on spring break with that guy because it's an immediate, like a hypergamy cannot afford to miss that kind of reproductive opportunity. But if you're the guy who comes across as being kind of naive, maybe this, well, you're, sweet. you're the guy that she wants to marry, not the guy she wants to fuck immediately, then there is you're put into a sort of your typecast right that's who she's that's who she, she looks at you as boyfriend material and if she's 23 she's not looking for boyfriend material when she's 30 she's definitely looking for boyfriend material because it chips her down if you don't understand that if you don't get if you can't wrap your head around that if you have a self-righteous sense of ego 
because you're doing the right thing, right? There's nothing more, there's nothing more annoying, I should say. There's nothing more self-righteous than a blue pill beta male guy who's made a lot of money and suddenly a girl that from his past looks him up on Facebook and they get married all of a sudden because she is just into him like, like he thinks it's genuine desire. She really wants me, Rolo. I gotta get with her, right? No, and it's, it's, it's convenient. I get this all, I, I've had like guys like Pat Stedman and other guys throw rocks at me saying, well, don't you think that she's sincere? She really does want to get right with God and she really does want to, uh, you know, start turn over a new leaf and she wants to get serious and she had her fun and she was so crazy in college. Don't you think that she's honest and, and genuine in that? Yes, yes, I do. That's just the problem. She believes it, you believe it. It's not the belief, it's not the, the approaching it from being genuine or being disingenuous. It's why now? Why at 30 years old? Why then? Why not at 20 when she's in her prime? Why not at 22, 24? Because that's when she's her most necessitous. And she better get you while you're still stupid before you have your midlife crisis. That is really not a crisis. It's just you coming to terms with the fact that, oh shit, I made a, I, I, I'm in my prime now. I could have, what oh what have i done i've got kids i got a uh, i got a business i got a house mortgage i got dogs in the yard what am i gonna do oh, i'll have a i think i'll buy a sports car <laughs> you're just trying to relive your youth no no you're not you're just realizing your worth that's what you're doing you're a big fish you're on the hook bring you right back in and why then why now I'm not saying it's dis in some case. Well, I mean, it could be disingenuous, of course. Women believe it. They would pass a lie detector test for something like that. Guys too. They believed it. I believed her. I thought she was. I thought she was sweet. She really wanted to get with me. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure she did. <laughs> So anyways, that is my show for today. I'm only going to have to go. It is now 1 p.m. here on the left coast in my secret bunker somewhere situated in the northern Nevada desert out in the scrubland. Uh, I will be uh, back on the show on Wednesday. I'll be doing a 30 minute show there. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you uh, want to uh, support the show, once again, uh, Patreon's good. Um, PayPal is good. Uh, I take crypto as well. Um, just have a look down there and see what you like. Um, and if you don't want to make a financial contribution, that's okay too. Please get the book read the book, educate yourself. Like I said, you need to, yeah, don't be dumb when 30, when 30 comes. Right. <laughs> and, uh, so have a look at that. Uh, the rational male, uh, where did I put it? There it is. Rational male religions right there. Um, you'll find it. It's the very first link in the description below. Uh, read that. That's my latest book, or you can read the first one, which is the Bible of the manosphere as probably most of you already know. There you go. Uh, I will be on tomorrow, by the way, on Rich Cooper's show, which is uh, before the train wreck. We're going to be talking about raising daughters. I would be, I wouldn't be surprised if we talked a little bit about Bill Gates too. Um, but we'll be talking about raising daughters, and uh, he has a daughter that's much younger than mine, but I have a daughter as well. So we're going to be talking about that. That's one of the questions we get a lot. Um, me in particular, well, what would you tell your daughter? Okay, well, here we're going to dedicate a whole show to it. Fire away. You guys can ask questions all you'd like. Uh, that will be at uh, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 o'clock Pacific, which is where I am. And uh, that'll be on Rich Cooper's Entrepreneurs and Cars channel. And that show is called Before the Train Wreck. And that will be tomorrow, with being Monday, uh, which is the 10th. So there you go. Uh, I have a few little special announcements that I wanted to get to, but I think I'm going to wait on them. I don't, I, on, on Wednesday, I think I'll, I'll pop off with them. I am going to be going out to Florida again. And I will explain to you guys why I'm going there. And uh, and yeah, part of it is because of Fresh and Fit, but there's another thing that I'm doing as well. So, um, and if you want to, if you want a teaser, go look at George Gammon's uh, YouTube channel because I'll be joining George Gammon at some point during that trip. So uh, have at it and uh, let me know what you thought about this in the comments. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye guys.